Hi, my name is Tom Crawford and welcome to the second video in our opacity tutorial. Uh, if you watched the first video, you are familiar with kind of the basic definition of opacity and some of the things that are going to affect opacity in our processes as we make paper or flexible packaging. And I cleaned this up since the last video because it looked a little bit rough. So uh, we'll have these here as we talk through opacity. Now this video, we're going to talk more specifically about the original instrument that was designed and manufactured to measure opacity and how that came about. Back in the 1930s again, if you watch the brightness video, you know that in the 1930s there was a lot of activity up in the upper Wisconsin area of, of the country and especially with the Institute of Paper Science uh, and Technology or Institute of Paper Chemistry at the time which was located up there and they had some great physicists in relationship to the optical characteristics of, of paper. And so, likewise, where brightness needed a, a good analytical tool for measuring where we are in the process and are we at our goal yet, same thing needed to happen with opacity. And so, uh, work began. And this time, a company called Bosch and Lom, who we're familiar with still today, uh, they were very involved in the development of the first unit. So several things went into that. And so a lot of it began with, though, the basic premise that we laid out in the initial conversation in the previous video about what is opacity. Opacity is a contrast ratio. It's looking at how a single ply of product, whether it be paper or flexible packaging, hides what is behind it, okay? So again, if we take this sheet, we have our great contrast here of black and white, and we put that on there, and we see that what I visually see here is much darker than what I see here because this is not doing a very effective job of hiding what is behind it as opposed to some of this material which is much more opaque and maybe you see a little bit there maybe you don't but it's a much higher this is probably like I said around a 95 opacity on that to where you can see maybe just a little bit I can standing here see a little bit of the darkness here and a little bit lighter over here and it's not until these two become equal that we're at hundred percent opacity okay so that's the premise that they were working on as they went about developing uh, this technology one of the first things they did is said okay how can I create this white white black backing that's going to give me consistency in the measurement. So one of them was very simple to do and that was a, a black cavity. So basically you could load a sample onto an instrument, you would back it by the black cavity and any light that transmitted went through the sheet would be absorbed in the black cup and not come back out. Okay, so you would get a reading. Then I would take that same sheet of paper and I'd back it by what they had was this white backing. And we'll define that in a second. So now the, the thought was, the theory and the, their concept was is that light that transmitted through this paper would strike this white body, not be absorbed like it was here, but would be sent back out, scattered back out, and that would be uh, read by the instrument. Okay, so you would create this different backing with this guy. So they went on by developing. Like I said, the, the black cavity was easy to do, but the white body was more difficult. Back in the 1930s, again, they looked at magnesium oxide. Okay, well, magnesium oxide, while it was nice and white, it was not very stable. And if you'd put it on an instrument, moisture, exposure, light, whatever it might be, you would see that deteriorate fairly quickly. So it was not a very consistent product for that. So they looked around. What could they find next? They found magnesium carbonate. They found chalk as a, a viable stable product to use as the white backing in this device. But there's a problem with chalk, right? Chalk leaves a residue, and that's how we're able to write on a, on a blackboard with it. So if I take this paper and I back it with chalk, right, some of that chalk is going to be left as a residue on that. So they had to, had to modify things a little bit. And so what they did is they took that chalk backing and they backed it up a little bit and put a piece of optical glass over the front of this. All right, so that now you could, you could calculate out basically that glass, but then you could have this nice white backing on that, and you could have a white backing, black backing. When they did this, measured the reflectance characteristics of this white backing, it had a reflectance of 89%. Okay, so you might hear the number R89, and that relates to this white backing that's on this. So they came up with the calculations. So you would make a measurement, 
and you would get what they called R0. And R0 would be that single sheet of paper backed by the black cup. And you would then measure that same single sheet of paper when it's backed by the white backing, which had a reflectance of 89%, so they called that R89. So R0 divided by R89 became the opacity value. So if R0 and R89 were the same number, it would be 100%. This is always going to be your lower number because it's backed by the black, black body. So if it's not 100% opaque, this will be lower than that. So it's a percent of, basically. All right. So that's what we're looking at when, we, uh, when we're measuring this opacity here. So you have this backing, which used basically this calculation. Then we got to talk a little bit about how the instrument was set up. Why they chose this exact setup, I don't know. Uh, I don't know all the, the history behind that, but here's how it goes, all right? So you have got a, a cube, all right? This is a, a cube, and this cube is coated with a high reflectance white coating, all right? So in the original unit, this cube set like this, and this is your sample port here, your sample port here. Now, it's important to remember, whenever we're talking about sample orientation and we're talking about the geometry of an instrument, you have to remember that if this is my sample, the perpendicular axis to my sample represents zero degrees, okay? So my sample sits here, perpendicular axis is zero degrees. I can deviate from that 5, 10, 15, 20, or that way, but at perpendicular axis is zero, okay? So with that definition, remember, so you've got a photo cell setting, excuse me, not a photo cell, you've got a sample port setting here, then the TAPI method, or the original method developed by Bosch and Lam, came off that perpendicular axis 15 degrees. And they set a lamp right there. Okay, so if you will, you've got, let's do it over here. You've got a, a lamp that's sitting here, let's say. Okay, and then you've got a, a sample port right there. So this angle here is 15 degrees. Okay, so it has 15 degree illumination. All right, now, once that light strikes the sample and you back it by the proper backing, whichever you're doing, that light is reflected back into this cube. And because that cube has a high reflectance coating on it, that energy just gets dispersed all around. And there's a photocell that sits here and that photo cell is looking at the energy inside this cube, all right? So because it has that, you've got a cube here. So ultimately what you get is the TAPI method is 15 degree illumination and diffuse viewing. 15 degrees because of this. And then a light reflects back into a cube, where it's read by a photocell that sits on the side of that, looking at that energy. Okay, so they developed that geometry to be fitted into the instrument. And then they had to decide, where in the spectrum am I going to make the measurement? All right, we've defined energy that we respond to as light and color as that energy that sits on the electromagnetic spectrum between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers, okay? For our world, anything that falls below 400 nanometers is UV energy. Anything that falls above uh, 700 nanometers, we just call infrared energy. All right, so that's how we break that down. And then, but we're mainly concerned with the 400 to 700 region of the spectrum. When they researched it, they, they, they came up with the idea that based on studies that we see light, human beings see light in the center region of the spectrum better than any of the other regions. It's almost like a bell-shaped curve, if you will. So if you think of how we see light, let's just do it up here. All right, if that's 400 and that's 700 nanometers, our ability to see light looks something like that, okay, with a peak out in the, in the center of the spectrum, which is the green region of the spectrum, okay? So opacity is looking at life through a green lens, okay? So we move that guy down. So if I'm going to pass the instrument, that's the world as I see it, through, through a green lens like that. So when they looked at, at defining this green filter that you have for uh, the instrument, 
they looked in the color, color world. And there's a definition for a green, what's called an illuminant. And we'll get into this when we talk about color more specifically, but there's a, what's called an illuminant A. And so they chose illuminant A, and then they looked at its Y function, which represents the green spectrum, green portion of the spectrum. And that had a central or dominant wave, like the 572 nanometers. So they set the uh, spectral response up for the original instrument and through to today because it's specified in the tapping method that we will do uh, illuminate a Y function. And so that represents 572 nanometers. So we have, we have a geometry, we have the spectral response, we have the calculation that's used to make the measurement. And that's what the industry used for uh, a number of years. And at, at one point, uh, back in the 1950s, the, the ISO community said, okay, this is good. We want to do our own thing with it. So we'll talk about that in the next video. But to wrap up this section on, on TAPI opacity, let's just look at a couple measurements real quick. Now, we had viewed some of these samples up on the board uh, originally. And so if I load this onto the instrument, and I've got my white backing, black backing here, okay? So I'm going to load that. The software instructs me to load the white body. So I'm going to test that. And then after it does that, it says now load the black body. So when it loads the white body, what it does is it takes that and it sets that to be 100%. So we don't have to do the calculation of R0 divided by R89. It just does it for us by doing that ratio real quick. So we now have to load the black cup. We hit test. And if this was 100% opaque, that would read 100. But it's not 100% opaque. It's 59.6. So it's, it's not a, it doesn't have a high opacity to that sheet. Now let's look at something that I think will have a higher opacity, this sheet. So I will load it on there. Back it by the white backing. Sets it at 100%. Rotate to the black backing. Hit test. 95, 95.1. Okay, so if we look at these real quickly to give you guys a visual on what we just saw. Okay, this one was right at, at 60. And this one was right at 95. Okay, so my guess is you, you can see quite a bit of difference here versus here as opposed to less difference here. If you can see it at all, I can see it easily from where I am. But this is around 95% opacity and this is around 60% opacity. So give you a little bit of visual there for that. But again, most applications don't require 100%. So it's that fine line of defining where do you set your tolerances, how do you set your tolerances, and then what of these tools do you use to control your opacity in your sheet? So that's the standard method. Now, most of you are making a web-based product, whether it's flexible packaging or paper, but it's a, it's a web-based product, and you want to get testing done as quick as you possibly can. We understand that. So built into the software are tools where you can, let's say you've got a, a web 10 feet wide, let's say, and you know it's fairly consistent going across there. You can set one white body backing, you can configure the software to use that, and then you can just pull the sample through, back, hit it with the black cup, you'll get your number, move the sample, black cup, sample black cup, black cup, and it will give you that, that good, a, a usable number at that point. Maybe you don't want to do that for a customer final verification, but it's certainly an adequate method for, for getting a quick average of what a, a strip might look like. Okay, So that's, in a nutshell, what we call tapi opacity. Okay, So remember, it has a, um, a cube, all right? And that's what this, this guy is. And so sitting at 15 degrees off the sample's perpendicular is a lamp, okay? That illuminates the sample. That light is reflected off that, and it goes into this cube, which is coated with a high reflectance white coating. A photo cell sits on the side of that, looking at the energy inside that cube. So if that energy is different between R0 and R89, it's gonna come up with something less than 100%, okay? Just as a point of reference, most people can detect about a point difference in opacity. And if things deviate by more than a point, we'll have reasonable agreement that, all right, that's more opaque than that. But things that are less than one point difference in opacity, we're probably going to argue over which is more opaque between the two. So our ability to distinguish is about one point of, of an opacity unit, if you will, OK? So that's the geometry. Remember, we've got the backing here, the, the R89 versus R0. 
it's tapio opacity, but you'll also hear the phrase contrast ratio. And so that's what this is, where you've got these two backings. And when that's used, sometimes you'll hear people refer to it. Or if you're reading an article, they'll mention contrast ratio. That's between these two fixed points, OK? So you've got that backing. We're looking at the illuminant A, the Y function, which represents 572 nanometers. So it's measuring out here in this green region of the spectrum. So it's looking at the sample through a green filter. And we already talked about the geometry, OK? So that's basically TAPI opacity, all right? So uh, the next video, like we said, we'll talk about ISO opacity. And then from there, we'll have a fourth video, which will kind of hopefully put a bow on everything. And we'll talk a bit about both methods uh, and then some of the differences you would expect in that. All right, guys, well, thanks for watching.